Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon. Uh, our guest today is uh, Ian McGregor, and we are talking today about his book that came out two years ago, and it's here behind me, and it's called Checkpoint Charlie, the Cold Wall, the Berlin Wall, and the Most Dangerous Place on Earth. Welcome, Ian. Thank you that you are oh. able to talk to us today. Um, thank, thank you for having me. May I ask you to introduce yourself uh, a little bit about your background, family background, sure. and stuff like this. Sure, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, my name's Ian. Uh, I live in London. I've been a publisher of non-fiction books, mainly history books for the past uh, 25 or so years. I work for a major global uh, publishing company and uh, my reputation in in the UK in London is of publishing big uh, historian uh, historians such as uh, Max Hastings, uh, Richard Overy, Simon Sharma, those type of people. Uh, I mainly deal in modern history. My specialty was modern European history. Uh, that was my degree as well as a student. And I've uh, I've always had love of uh, obviously modern European history and the Cold War, uh, which we can talk about as we go, uh, what my background is. Uh, and I was lucky enough, I'm pretty much the same age as you, Bernd. So I'm a, a, I'm a child of the Cold War, so to speak. So I was lucky enough to go on student exchanges to Germany and to Russia in the early 1980s uh, and as a teenager that really uh, uh, increased my desire and passion about the subject and that's why I did my degree in, in, in European history uh, and that's led me to be a publisher of history books and it's only in the last few years I've decided uh, that I hopefully had the uh, the interest, the passion and the talent to, to write a book. So. Checkpoint Charlie is uh, is three years in the making because I had to uh, uh, spend a long time investigating, tracking down the various people that I wanted to uh, interview for the book that would give a complete picture of what life was like on the east and west side. Uh, Travelling to Germany, to France, to America and around Britain to meet these veterans, whether they were military, civilian or political or media, uh, to give the reader a very balanced uh, uh, viewpoint from all sides of what, what it was like with the Berlin Wall uh, between 1961 and 1989. So why did you as a Scotsman uh, wrote a book about Checkpoint Charlie? Would an average person on the street in London or in Edinburgh know the name Checkpoint Charlie or even combine it with the Cold War? Well, e even uh, the name Checkpoint Charlie, even though it's synonymous with Berlin, the fact that it became so famous within Berlin, uh, Checkpoint Charlie as a, as a, a name or a term is, is now in the lexicon of, of the English language. So any major uh, border crossing is always given in the media and in the press. It's given the kind of a uh, tagline of it's, it's checkpoint Charlie. That's it's the most it's the crucial uh, point between whatever border conflicts going on. Uh, my my uh, my background or my the the way my my uh, interest and passion was for this subject was uh, like I said I, I I've got a very from a history and a political point of view I've, I've always been lucky enough to be. Uh, brought up that way by parents who were very into their history and their politics, especially my father. My father served in the British Army, uh, British Army of the Rhine in the 1950s after he'd been in Korea uh, during the conflict there. So he was in the British Army for many years. And my family's history, going back grandfathers, great grandfathers, they've all been in the military. So I'm, I'm, I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm the one who didn't go into the military. Uh, so as a boy growing up, I learned from my grandfather, father and uncles who all served what life was like serving in the British Army in, in Germany. Uh, 
and my father had, uh, he never served in Berlin, but he took leave for his, his holiday passes that he got. Uh, he visited West Berlin. So again, I was told about what an incredible city it was and how exciting it was to be there, East and West, city of spies, military garrisons, all that kind of thing, deep inside uh, East Germany by 100 kilometers or so. And then getting on to your last question about would it, would Checkpoint Charlie, the Berlin Wall, would that uh, be popular with a, a British audience today? I, I think yes, yes. For I would say for a certain age group, for a certain generation, my generation, like I said earlier on, because I consider myself and my generation uh, students, child, children of the Cold War, we grew up, as you did, uh, under the the uh, the umbrella or under the uh, the pressure and the paranoia of what could happen between the superpowers, what could happen in Europe if war became a reality, uh, and how all all in Europe especially all points led to Berlin because, like we just said, it's Berlin was inside East Germany. Berlin was almost like the uh, the weather vane, the weather station of were East and West getting on? Was the Warsaw Pact? Did it have plans to invade the West? If it did, it would obviously always target Berlin. So like I said, I think in the modern day, it, it definitely is. I mean, I, I did a podcast last week for one of the main history podcasts in the UK. And I've been told yesterday it's, it's their biggest downloaded podcast they've had this year. So that goes to show that there is a thirst uh, uh by the general population for wanting to know more and obviously the 60th anniversary of the berlin wall being built that does help because there's lots of news stories going on in the uk right now uh obviously there's bigger stories going on around the world especially with the pandemic but uh i think if you ask a younger audience it doesn't matter so much because they never grew up in this east and west uh confrontation where nuclear war we were always taught could happen any minute now and we wouldn't have that much time to uh, prepare ourselves and whether we survived or not was a toss of a coin uh that's not what's taught to our children certainly to my children i have teenage children now and when i talk to them about this subject they're interested but they're not i would say they're not fascinated Whereas I think for my generation, the people that I see in the talks that I give, uh, they're, they're always full. Uh, there's never a spare seat. Uh, and I, I would like to think it's because of me, but I don't think it's because of me. It's because of the subject I'm talking about. Yes, I know that uh, the subject Cold War, especially in Anglo-American areas, have a, a much uh, higher value than, for example, Germany. Um, you said at the beginning of uh, your book uh, that this is a collection of uh, different stories from different people and uh, different perspectives. How did you manage to get all these stories and how did you find these people uh, who can tell these stories? Uh, investigative uh, uh, footwork, I should say. Uh, like I said, it took three years from actually uh, having the book commissioned and then obviously for this kind of uh uh travel to investigate and, and interview people excuse me you need you need the finances to do it so i couldn't i i would never have been able to do it unless a publisher takes a leap of faith and says okay we'll commission the book and and here's some uh some money up front to undertake the the various travel journeys you'll have to do and you start small, so you'll you'll start. I, I had a, a list probably of maybe ten people that I, through my research online, I I I knew I'd, I'd want to talk to them. So, uh, Sir Robert Corbett, who was Major General Robert Corbett, who was the commander of the British sector in 1989, I I found him online, and then I contacted him, and then I set up an interview, and as with all of the. It, it happens all the time I've found anyway. It's once you're once you've sat down and you're interviewing someone, they will tell you their story, but they will always say as you're as they're being interviewed, oh, you should go and talk to such and such a person 
because they will have something extra to tell you about what I am telling you. And so one door opens, which leads to another door, which leads to another door. And that's how the process went. That's why it took so long, because I would be introduced to a wider circle of people, uh, whether they were French, American, uh, British, East and West German or Russian. And then it would always take time to uh, give them my credentials uh, for them to understand what I wanted to talk to them about, uh, to agree what the questions would be, and then to actually conduct the interview. And quite a few of the, interv the people I interviewed wanted a face-to-face -face interview. So that would always take time and would take planning and would take money because some of the interviews, because obviously I interviewed a lot of the American personnel that were in Berlin, and some of them are still in America and wanted me to come over to America. So I had to wait until I had uh, quite a few that I could contact in one trip. And then, then I would travel around within that week to meet them all and interview them. And it was the same in Germany, which is how you and I first met, was uh, I would go to Berlin or somewhere else and I would, I'd, I'd have a week of interviews uh, and then many of the interviews were over the the, uh, the internet like we're doing now so that that was easier uh, but it was just a very drawn out process as, as it should be because it's you know you're you're telling people stories and you want to accurately uh, uh, write them write them up yeah that's where for example uh, you have a guy called Adolf uh, Knackstedt mm -hmm. and uh, he had a pretty interesting job in the 50s uh, in Berlin and in Frankfurt. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about Adolf Knackstedt and his job in Berlin and Frankfurt? Sure. Well, I, I met him in Berlin. So that, that was a, one of these things I was telling you about. The, the Berlin Brigade, uh, the US Berlin Brigade, the veterans, uh, they were having a 75th anniversary uh, get together in Berlin for the Berlin Airlift commemorations. And I just, I was lucky enough. It's one of those things where you didn't, I didn't plan it and I couldn't believe my luck. They, at the, because uh, there was over 150 veterans came over and there were different age ranges from, say, 50 years of age because they served right at the end of the Cold War. Or like Adolf Nachstedt, they were well into their 80s because they they served in the 50s and the 60s. I just happened to be sitting next to him. And as we discussed life in general, and he started talking about his his story, I obviously thought, well, I need to properly interview you, which is what we did. And we set that up. And uh, he lives in Fort Bragg in North Carolina uh, on the base. Uh, and his story is extraordinary, I think. I mean, you could he literally should write his autobiography. He's that he's that fascinating so he was uh he was born in the usa from german parents who'd emigrated during the depression in the late 1920s from germany uh they'd had their children in the bronx in new york and then obviously once the second world war had started uh his father uh wished to bring the family back to the third reich and uh instead of being placed in an internment camp uh in texas uh so they escaped and through various adventures they were chased at one point by british intelligence they managed to uh get back to germany and uh they stayed with relatives just outside berlin uh they survived the war uh their father disappeared for a few years during the war and just after the war uh and the stories that adolf told me about he'd served in the intelligence the advir uh, but anyway, the family then found themselves in Berlin and living in the Soviet sector once the Allies had split the city up into occupational zones. And he was just falling, him, him and his brother Hansi uh, were falling into trouble because a lot of, like a lot of teenage children, they were to survive, they were stealing things from Allied stocks uh, like coal and food. And they'd been caught once too often by the Soviet authorities. So the parents, his parents said, you, you know, you can you can go back to the USA because you're a you're a citizen. So he did. He traveled back to the USA in the early 50s, uh, enlisted in the US military, and because of his background, spoke 
perfect Berlin dialect German. Uh, he was, uh, as soon as he passed his basic training, he was in the US military intelligence service. And then he returned to Berlin pretty much as a spy. I mean, he was serving, he served two, two years in Berlin in the 50s, even before his parents who lived in Berlin were aware he was there. And so once you get to the time of the wall being built, he was actually what we would call in the in uh, the English language a spook. He was going in and out of uh, the Soviet sector and reporting back what was going on. Uh, and then he's obviously watching the East German authorities build the first barriers and everything he saw, he reported back as well. Uh, and then some of the more famous inc uh, incidents, such as uh, some of the first shootings uh, and what the allies did in terms of how they uh, responded to the, the uh, what the East Germans were doing in building the barriers. And then famously, the uh, uh, Comrade Schumann jumping over the barbed wire, the East German guard who famously is on thousands of T-shirts and posters that you can buy of him flinging his submachine gun aside as he jumps over the barbed wire. Adolf was actually his bodyguard. So he was given the the, the job of of keeping him safe while they managed to get him processed and out of West Berlin as quickly as possible into West Germany because uh, the East German authorities were very keen to try and get him back because obviously it was a, a coup for publicity to, uh, reasons for the West. So he was given those kind of jobs, but he, he had a very, very crucial job in terms of even before the war went up and after the war went up, people that escaped through from East to West Generally, Adolf would be part of the team that was processing them and figuring out uh, how important they were in terms of what they had to tell the Western authorities, whether military or political. And if they were deemed to be important, then then uh, Adolf was kind of their minder, their bodyguard, and he would be flying out with them to the West to then process them through Camp Crystal, I think it was called, which was the US intelligence camp. Uh, which he belonged to. So he had a vital job. And yeah, I mean, it was just an amazing story. And ironically, his wife, Vera, who's obviously a Berliner as well, she just happened to be on holiday in, in West Berlin in 19, November 1989 when the wall came down. So for a writer like myself, the, the, the story arc was perfect. So it was just fantastic to meet them and interview them. It was amazing uh, to see that Adolf Knackstedt had uh, indeed a very important job uh, concerning the refugees coming from uh, East Berlin uh, to to West Berlin and from the East to the West. Mm. And those were hundreds of thousands every mm. year. Yeah. And obviously that played a major role in the minds of uh, the GDR how yep. to stop that flood of um, refugees. So Ian, could you summarize uh, for us uh, the building of the wall um, in a couple of uh, sentences? Uh, it was uh, sprung on the, the Allies uh, on August 13th, 1961. Uh, it was a weekend, so it, it caught everyone by surprise. A uh, huge undertaking, thousands of construction workers uh, putting up the barriers, which were really cement posts and barbed wire to begin with, uh, which was to test the resolve to see what was the Allied response. It was built inside uh, the Soviet sector. So really, from a military and political point of view, there was not much the Allies could do because it wasn't in, it wasn't encroaching on their sector. And uh, over 150 kilometers of barriers that sealed the city completely. 192 streets cut off, uh, 97 streets going out into the hinterland of East Germany and 95 crossing the city itself. Uh, U-Bahn closed, uh, the stations I should say, S-Bahn was the same, uh, and 81 official crossing points that allowed you access to the city were reduced to 10, one of which was Checkpoint Charlie. And uh, looking at the activities on the 13th of August, uh, would you say that the plan of the GDR leadership worked out perfectly? 
uh, where the Western powers really caught by surprise or couldn't they foresee uh, any action like this? Because as mentioned before, uh, somehow the GDR had to stop this flood of refugees. Well, it, it's, uh, it depends on how you interpret the, the sources that you'll find in the archives. I mean, there's a great, there's still a great deal that haven't been released by all allied governments about exactly what was going on over the weeks preceding the barrier, the first barriers going up. But like me, if you've, if you've read as many of the sources as possible and you've interviewed many of the, the military veterans on the allied side anyway, that witnessed the barriers going up, it's hard not to come to the conclusion that, yes, it, 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 I think the, the scale of what the East Germans and the Soviets wanted to do, seal the whole city off, that's beyond anyone's imagination, I think. To, to actually do it so quickly and thoroughly and successfully, I think that's what caught the Allies by surprise. But in terms of uh, did the Allies know that the, the East Germans and the Soviets wanted or were planning some kind of solution to, as you just said, the flood of my immigrants that were coming from east to west uh, and they were going to do something about it? Then, yes, they did know. Uh, all the signals were there uh, in terms of the intelligence communities that, that were reporting on uh, what these refugees were seeing as they were coming from through East Berlin, across into West Berlin and to the refugee centers. There were lots of reports, obviously hundreds of reports, and it's, it's how you accumulate those reports to build the picture, the actual what is going on. But lots of people were saying that there were buildup of trucks, uh, construction materials, workers in the hinterland outside of the city. Uh, what did that mean? Uh, Military intelligence uh, for the US and the UK reported that uh, two or three uh, motorized East German divisions had now been given orders to start moving. And that was at least three to three days to a week before Operation Rose, which is what it was called, was implemented. So again, that, that must have set off some kind of alarm with the Allies as in what was going on. And then there was obviously military and political refugees that were coming from east to west that were, again, telling the allies that, that interviewed them as in something big is going to happen very, very soon. Uh, even though Walter Albrecht, head of the, the GDR, had, uh, is famous as saying no one has any intention of building a wall in this uh, in the press comments he gave a week before it all happened. Uh, again, to the political leaders, they knew they could see and, and knew that he was taking countless journeys to the Kremlin to have face-to-face -face meetings with Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the head of the, the USSR. And obviously that was the main topic because Khrushchev had brought it up in the Vienna summit that summer in June with John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, who'd come over specifically to kind of thrash out how would they resolve the pressure that was building up in the centre of Europe Whereas Khrushchev, like Stalin, wanted a unified Germany, but he wanted a neutral Germany, disarmed Germany, because obviously he's in the hope of eventually they would, they like that, like they had with the other East European countries, by stealth, a communist coup might might actually seize the reins of power in Germany. It was in their interest to have it completely demilitarized. Whereas for the Allies, obviously, as of the Potsdam Agreement from July '45. They wanted to have their place secured, not just in West Germany and have a strong East German, a West German state, sorry, which they would support, but they still wanted their rights in West Berlin, which again, they wanted to keep as uh, an international city and they wanted to keep their garrisons there. So two completely divergent uh, uh, points of view, but like I said, just if you take away that and just look at what ordinary people were seeing, there was lots of lots of messages, lots of uh, information coming in that in hindsight, obviously, a historian can see, well, they must have known something. Uh, they must have known something was going to happen that was maybe going to stop in their tracks, these people crossing the borders. But I don't think anyone had the the the. Uh, 
the clear image that they were literally going to seal off the city because it was just such a huge endeavor. But on the other hand, if you have in mind that uh, the Western Allies knew that uh, something is going to happen, uh, in those stories where you have British and US perspectives of soldiers, uh, I missed a three partite cooperation of the British, the American, and the French. Uh, there is no hint um, in, in your book and things I've seen that the three city commanders were planning together how to react and what to do in a case of a military emergency. And actually, I would expect something like this, something like a coordinated Western uh, powers uh, reaction in that kind of a crisis. But um, did you come across uh, any hints that those three were coordinating um, in those early hours? Um, no, there's no I, I could. Well, again, from the sources and the people I interviewed, I couldn't find a clear a clear picture that the three Allied commanders had a unified response to what had happened. They were talking, obviously they were talking to each other. They, they met within hours. Uh, but obviously each of the commanders, French, British and American, are answering to their own governments and their own political leaders. And it's the time frame that that took uh, for them to get answers. Uh, which led to the the very delayed response as to what they were going to do, uh, because obviously, like we were just saying, that this all happened over a weekend. Uh, everyone's got the kind of it's, it's it's a hot August. A lot of Berliners have gone to their their garden allotments or 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 second homes outside the city, or they've gone for like a weekend's holiday to the lakes or the forests. A lot of the allies had too. a lot of the power the, you know, the guys, the people that were running the the, the military garrisons in the city uh, were away. Uh, but also the, their governments back home in Paris, London and New York, such as Kennedy. Kennedy wasn't in Washington when it happened. So that all took time. And it's not like we are today where we have 24 hour rolling news, mobile phones, satellite communications, all that kind of thing. It took time for this news clear news and uh, a clear understanding of what the uh, the communists were doing in Berlin because you'd need a clear picture before you can make a have a clear response they're obviously on the the the, the flip side of that the the average soldiers mainly military police because obviously they were the ones guarding the borders in the allied sectors those men that I interviewed of that time, August 13th, 1961, nearly all of them were frustrated, angry, and uh, felt let down that there wasn't a coordinated, strong allied response immediately. And by immediately, I mean within 24 hours uh, to what the East Germans and the Russians were doing. And famously, one of the military police officers for the US that uh, that you've met, uh, Werner Pike, uh, he said to me that on his uh, at his station where he's he's watching them build the barriers, and a lot of the uh, uh, the East German border guards are actually shouting out to him, saying, "We we have no bullets in these guns." Uh, because famously, that's what they. A lot of the guards on on the the, the border uh, either had very little ammunition or no ammunition because they they the uh, uh, Ulbricht and Honecker, who was who was the architect of, who'd been given the job of implementing Operation Rose, were extremely worried, extremely paranoid that there would be gunfire on the border, and that's the last thing they wanted. They wanted to, to try and go as smoothly as possible, and primarily. The, the guards on the, on the border are, are making sure their own people aren't trying to do a last minute escape while they can, while the border is still being, uh, the barriers are still being built. So the Americans were saying to me, well, they, these guys were shouting to us saying, we have, we, we don't have any ammunition in these guns. You could actually come through right now if you wanted to. Why aren't you? And so that that's what these these um, these allied soldiers were thinking. Why why aren't we doing any, doing anything? And then that feeling of frustration and anger was magnified by the West Berliners, the civilian population themselves. Uh, 
again, the people that I interviewed, they 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 felt uh, abandoned. Uh, their morale was very low. They were paranoid and fearful, as in, well, this must be the first step to the the communists, the, the East German authorities now taking over the whole of the city. What's going to happen to us? Are they going to cut off our electricity, gas and water supplies? Are we going to have another Berlin airlift? Uh, those thoughts were going through everyone's mind. Uh, so I think people, that that's what I try and, and emphasize to, you're on about the younger generation. That's what I try and emphasize to students when I talk to them about this subject is you've got to remember just how uh, how little information was being given to the civilian population in West Berlin at the time and how that can cause paranoia, uh, stress, uh, fear about, well, what's the next step? Because like I said, people didn't have the kind of communications that we have today. So you, you would only find out through people actually verbally telling you or you might read it in the newspaper. So it's a completely different world. So, yeah, I would say, getting back to your main point, the, the, the Allies were taken completely by surprise and the commanders weren't going to move unless they were told so by their political uh, governors. And that took some time in coordinating, it took many days. I guess, I guess the most important uh, piece of information that the soldiers on that day after a couple of hours uh, received is that it is no attack on the Western uh, territory at all. Mm. So the tanks uh, Friedrichstraße are not hitting into the West direction. They're hitting uh, their own people and uh, all the soldiers, uh, massive uh, amounts of soldiers, they stayed in inside their own border. Well, so yeah. maybe that was the most important piece for the military uh, people, but obviously not for the politicians. Yeah. Well, it was still a concern, though, because you've got to you've got to remember it was two motorized divisions, East German motorized divisions. So that, that's thousands of troops, heavily armed troops, uh, both inside and outside the city. So one motorized division is covering the, the splits going through the city. And the other motorized division is obviously surrounding the hinterland of the allied sectors. And they're supported by, you know, almost 200 or well, more than 200 tanks and armored cars. So that's a very, very big undertaking, very intimidating, because obviously supporting them are thousands of Red Army troops and tanks and planes and everything else. So if you're in that city, you're thinking, well, we're surrounded. And as we talked about it before, this is this is what it, what is it? It would have been fifteen or so years after the the Berlin airlift, and you you must be thinking, well, it's all happening again. Only this time, it's a lot more serious. They're actually splitting the city, and the Allies. I meant to say to get back to the previous point, the Allies. Uh, the first few days of the the barriers going up, it was still confusing as to whether the Allies still had their, their, their freedom of travel into the Soviet sector, and they still had their freedom of travel going back to West Germany. So as soon as that, you're on about the commander's response, as soon as that was established that, oh, right, okay, they're, they're, not, gonna, they're not gonna touch the Allied garrisons from having their normal routes of transport touched. And again, that was a major plus point for them. They're thinking, okay, they. They're literally doing this to their own people. Yeah, a good point about touching touching allied rights. Uh, that uh, leads us directly to the next uh, crisis in October 1961, when Checkpoint Charlie was a place where this new crisis took place and uh, it had a huge potential for a much bigger military crisis. Mm. Uh, can you tell us uh, the background of uh, the tank confrontation in October 1961 at Checkpoint Charlie? And um, and as I've seen, it all started with a vehicle control at the Friedrichstraße. Yeah, well, ju just to, to lay the groundwork very quickly is this has been building up for weeks be because John F. Kennedy uh, wanted to give the, the Berlin as a morale booster. Uh, to, to obviously tell them, you haven't been forgotten, the Allies aren't going to abandon you, don't worry. So he'd ordered his Vice President, Lyndon Baines Johnson, to fly over uh, 
to West Berlin as a PR stunt almost to, to go there and show that, you know, the, the second most powerful man in the world is coming to your aid and is going to be there for a couple of days and, and see the citizens and shake their hands and, uh, and, and, and give them the confidence that the Allies aren't going to forget. And he's backed up by a, a, an American uh, battle group that comes up the Autobahn from West Germany and and uh, is stationed in Berlin. The Berlin Brigade, the US Berlin Brigade is, is created specifically to say, you've got your own unit now that's gonna protect West Berlin. And on top of that, which gets to your point, is uh, his man on the ground, his military man on the ground that JFK wants is General Lucius Clay, who'd been the hero of the Berlin airlift. He'd masterminded that. Uh, he'd actually been the first allied commandant who'd run the Commandatura uh, in 1945. So to Berliners, obviously, this is only 15 or so years later, he's a hero to them. And for him to come back and say, well, I'm your man on the ground now, he didn't actually have a place in the in the, the command structure, which really annoyed the American commander. Yeah, because he was, he was a civilian at that point. Exactly. He was re retired and working in the civilian business. Exactly. So. But because he had Kennedy's ear, he had a lot of uh, leeway to actually order people to do things. So just up in the weeks running up to the, the tank standoff in October 61, Clay had been very belligerent. He really bolstered the, the resolve of the Allies to say, we are not taking a step backwards. Uh, he'd increased maneuvers of the American troops of the Berlin Brigade right on the border. In clear view of the East Germans watching, He'd had them practice bulldozing through uh, fences and walls because by now, obviously, a wall was being built by October. The barbed wire was being replaced by breeze blocks. So it's a proper physical border with armed guards. Uh, a few people had already died. Uh, shoot to kill policy was in place. Uh, so all that was going on. So the tension, as you're talking about, the, there's a reason behind this tank standoff. The tension was palpable. Uh, everyone was waiting for, well, what's going to happen next? And what did happen next was the next logical step for the East Germans, who kind of drove this, was, well, we're going to really squeeze tightly now on the Allies' rights to travel into, into East Berlin, into the Soviet sector. And the agreement had always been, and it helped the Soviets as well, if you've got diplomatic or military plates, you can go straight through the, the, the checkpoint controls. No one's going to touch you. Uh, because that's that's the Allied rights of travel. And it was the same for the Soviets. They could come into the Allied sectors too. But on that night, Alan Leiter, who's a junior US diplomat, uh, he was taking his wife, Dorothy, to uh, the opera, because obviously the best opera was in East Berlin, because that just happened to be the sectors that the Russians had. It was a cheap night out because of the disparity in the currency. So you could live and, and like a king, best meals, go to the opera, and it, it wouldn't cost you that much. So lots of military and political uh, leaders and commanders in the allied sectors would do this all the time. And so what he was doing was nothing extraordinary. He was just going for a night out with his wife. And they were stopped at the border by an East German uh, a border officer who demanded to see their papers, totally against uh, the, the unwritten rules. And obviously Leiter refused and he sat there in his car at the checkpoint and wouldn't budge. And the standoff was only relieved once General Clay had found out about this and taking matters into his own hands because, of, like you said, he's a civilian, really. He's not part of the military command. He sent uh, armed military police in jeeps with bayonets fixed to go out to the, the beleaguered diplomat in his Volkswagen by the East German uh, border and not only rescued him, but then to prove a point, drove them in a, a big route around the, the government sector of the city that the Soviets controlled, just to kind of thumb their noses and say, well, you, you're not stopping us. And then this happened two or three times. It didn't have just happen once. It happened again and again. And then it got to the point where Clay thought, I really do need to, to uh, make a statement here to show we're not going to be intimidated. And he took matters into his own hands and he ordered uh, four manoeuvres out to the border. And at Checkpoint Charlie, that's why you ended up having uh, US tanks right on the edge. And then it became a game of chess and who's going to back down first. And what I, I think what Clay didn't 
take into account was the Russians were going to match in tank for tank. And before you knew it, you had a dozen US tanks right by Checkpoint Charlie, engines gunning, uh, locked and loaded, waiting to find out what the Russians were doing. But the trouble was, obviously, even though the Allied garrisons are powerful, they're a very small unit compared to what they're going up against with the, the forces in East Berlin and the forces surrounding Berlin. Uh, and the Russians easily brought up two dozen tanks that were in the side streets just waiting to see what was going to happen. And obviously, it's very intimidating. You've got tanks staring down the barrels at each other. And as we all know, wars can start with just one person pulling the trigger by mistake. And again, as we talked about before, this is before we had rolling news. It's before we had instant communications. So the process of trying to dial down the tension and for the Allies to realise what do the East Germans and the Russians actually want from this situation and how do we get ourselves out of it? And first and foremost, which I tell in the book, is the mainly the Americans. It was because Checkpoint Charlie's on the American sector. The Americans had to find out who's in those tanks, who, who do those tanks belong to. If they're Russians, that's fine because it's part of the we can deal with that and there's official channels and we'll we'll definitely be able to sort this out. But if they're East German tanks and East German crews, that's a major problem because A, we don't recognize the sovereign state of East Germany and they shouldn't be there. They're in the Soviet sector and it it breaks lots of different rules that we had from Potsdam about what the Allies well, they were the Allies. What they so could do. Yes, basically, it was it was a uh, positive uh, that uh, there were Russian tanks um, mm. opposite the U.S. tanks, and it uh, would have been a much bigger problem yes. if it were East German tanks. Yes. So, because there are Russian tanks, uh, this uh, situation could be solved via diplomatic channels. Mm. And in retrospect, perspective, uh, obviously, no. No, no, no side wanted an armed conflict at Checkpoint Charlie in October 1961. Uh, but was it just to show and to underline the new political situation with the wall? Or maybe was it another test how far uh, the GDR and Soviet side could go before Western powers would react? I think, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a test because... Uh... Albrecht was basically the point of the spear for Khrushchev in terms of what uh, they could do in terms of pressurizing the Allies to leave Berlin. I mean, that, that was the key thing. They, they wanted, uh, if they couldn't have a, a unified, neutral Germany, they definitely, definitely wanted uh, a neutral uh, and unified Berlin, especially if it's 100 kilometers inside Soviet uh, territory. Uh, and that 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 hadn't changed. And I, I would imagine, obviously, I, cu I couldn't interview Walter Ulbricht, but I would imagine it was an affront to the East Germans that uh, to them, it obviously, obviously, you know, Berlin's Hauptstadt. It, it, it's, it's, a so it's a sovereign country and they want Berlin to be the capital city of this sovereign country and to have allied soldiers and personnel taking up uh half of it is uh an insult to them uh they were trying their luck i suppose they they and obviously that they were that situation of demanding uh, uh identification on the border would not have happened if the kremlin hadn't given its uh the, the green light uh it just wouldn't have happened because of what it caused afterwards uh and I think, yeah, it, it was a case of uh, they were just trying their luck to see what they could get away with. And they were soon uh, dealt a very firm rebuttal by the US, but by, by Clay, I should say. And, and But I think he went too far. And I again, if you talk to the average American soldier on the ground, they applauded him and said that was fantastic. I think if we'd done that in August, we wouldn't be in this mess. Uh, but to the military commanders were completely aghast and angry of, uh, to what he'd done. That obviously went up the chain of command into uh, NATO, Western Europe, uh, where it was then going on to Washington and to London. 
and to Paris about why have we let this guy loose in, in West Berlin? Look at the damage he's causing. Uh, he really needs to be reined in. And he quickly was. He was quietly uh, brought back to Washington. Uh, and and that was the last thing he, he, he did as a, a military commander. So I don't think it would have, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot of significance given to it because it looks a fantastic photograph where you've got U.S. and Russian tanks facing off against each other. Uh, but again, having interviewed many people that were there at the time, I think there was always a uh, a tacit agreement between the Americans and the Russians, and the Americans really respected the Russians as a military force. They didn't respect the East Germans, but they respected the Russians, and. I think both sides knew they had to dial it down. They just needed the, that to go back up the chain of command for that to happen. And that's what did happen. And they both, you know, uh, can't lose their face. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, they yeah. were there. You've got the world's media watching. Well, you've got the yeah. world's media on the Western side watching because that's what happened. I mean, there's all those famous photographs of them coming down Friedrichstrasse and the tanks lining up. Uh, and you can see in the distance the T-72s and who are, who are in those tanks. Who are these people? Because they had they had black uniforms with no insignia. The tanks had no insignia. So it's how do you find out who are who these people are? And once they had found out, which, again, are very interesting stories, uh, it was easier then to solve the problem. Well, you know, talk will end here, but uh, your book continues until the fall of the wall and the German unification and the uh, dismantling of Checkpoint Charlie on June 22nd of June 1990. Mm. And uh, about um, the other passages in your book, is there there's a one story uh, that um, uh, that's uh, your favorite ones in the from the 70s 80s or even at the from unification you want to tell us uh i suppose uh well it, it, obviously from a british perspective it, it's, it's very interesting what happened to sir robert corbett who was major general corbett who was command commandant commanding british sector 1989 uh he'd only he hadn't been there that long uh and obviously he's been told by his political masters when they interviewed him for the job uh, nothing's going to change. Can't see anything changing in the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall, the East-West standoff. Can't see it changing for still quite a few years, even though Gorbachev has had his summit with Reagan and things are starting to dial down slightly. But, you, you, you know, your two year stint as commandant is, is going to be the same as it's been before. And obviously, very quickly, he's dealing with the Berlin Wall coming down and the unification of Germany. So on the night that it happened, he's, a, he's, a, he's caught unawares, just like everybody else was. And he's rushing around his sector, trying to figure out, well, what do we do? How do we respond? And one of the, the key instances where he responded brilliantly is the, uh, the small Russian garrison that's by the War Memorial near the Brandenburg Gate, which is in the British sector, that the Russians were always allowed to, to send a guard of honour to the war memorial uh, through the British sector to guard the war memorial. And as you know, the war memorial is sacrosanct to Red Army soldiers because it represents the sacrifice of their troops, over 80,000 killed to capture Berlin in 1945. Uh, but that garrison was being surrounded by very angry and, vo and vocal West Berliners who obviously were celebrating the wall finally coming down and they detested the Russians. So they were, it could have easily escalated to, you know, if you, if you take it to its logical conclusion, it could have been a mini Tiananmen Square, maybe, maybe. Uh, and he stopped that. He, he, he went to the Russian garrison. He had an interpreter with them. He had the soldiers standing around him while he sat in the middle. And he said to them, I don't know what's going on tonight. I'm just like the rest of you. But all I can guarantee is you're in my sector. And whilst you're in my sector, no harm will come to you. And he'd already got the West, the West Berlin police commander to then put a circle of policemen around the garrison to protect them too. So that visibly relaxed everyone and the situation was diffused. But within hours, he'd been rung by 
the headquarters of the, the British military in West Germany saying, you know, what the hell are you doing over there? And he said, he's asking them, well, why? What do you mean? He said, well, we've just had a communication channel that's been closed by Stalin since the Berlin airlift. It's just reopened. And the message has come through by the head of the, the Soviet military uh, for the whole of Eastern Europe, uh, naming you and thanking you for what you've done. And the Red Army will never forget what you've done. And he was obviously taken aback, thinking, well, gosh, what have I done? And then he realized what he had done. But the, 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 the nice ending to the story is every year on, uh, obviously, uh, Soviet Memorial Day, he receives presents uh, from the Russians every year. So if you look in Robert's study, he's got this big cupboard and he opens the cupboard up and it's got really expensive vodka, uh, Soviet insignia, so beautiful Soviet uh, generals hats in their boxes. He, he gets everything. It'll make an amazing museum if he ever wants to show it off. And he, he gets well, that I, every year. Yeah, my favorite uh, unification story is also from uh, Sir Robert, Robert Cabet. And when he handed over his original uniform uh, to the Allied Museum, uh, he told us how he learned that uh, the, the wall came down and that the border is open now. Uh, he was on a reception on that night and uh, the driver came into the reception, uh, to the reception to see him and said the red telephone in the car is ringing. And as you mentioned already, no mobile telephones, but there was a, a telephone in the car and on the red telephone in the car is always the guy in Bonn, the minister in Bonn. And uh, he took up uh, the telephone and the guy on the other side shouted, they are coming across, they are coming across. And Corbett asked, who, who, who is coming across? Well, East German population. I said, oh, God. <laughs> okay, <laughs> could, it be, could be worse. <laughs> yeah. so well, I was just, just, just to very, very quickly say, I, th I think one of the key uh, the key things that happened in, in the research and interviewing for this whole project was I was with Hans Uli Jorgis, who uh, works for Stern magazine. And I was interviewing him uh, in a cafe on Unter den Linden. And to me, it, it, it really brought home, because obviously I'm, I'm, I'm British, I'm looking at a German piece of history. So to, to interview someone like him, who's a very, he's larger than life. He, he, I mean, he takes over the room. He's got such a powerful character, very jovial, laughs a lot, a booming voice. And his, his, I won't go into detail about his family story, but they, they fled from east to west. And very painful story uh, in terms of what they gave up and the persecution and everything else. And he became a journalist and he worked for Reuters and various other news agencies. And he, he'd reported in Berlin as well. But he was in, I think he was in Hanover uh, when the wall opened. But anyway, as I was interviewing him in this cafe, he's really busy and we're having such a lovely time. It's been very funny and he's been very, you know, like I said, he's larger than life. But when I asked him, uh, what did you do when you heard the wall was opened? And he said, I sent a telegram to my East German relatives that were still there saying, today we have freedom. And then he just burst into tears in a very public place. He was, you know, tears running down his face to the point where I was thinking, well, what do I do? What do I say? And then he, he, he got himself back together again. But that brought home to me just what kind of price was paid by the German people for the Berlin Wall and the intra-German border and what they suffered. And I hope that's what I tried to capture in the book is it's just not uh, facts and figures and military information and that kind of thing. I wanted to capture the human story. And, I, and, and it sprung from that interview with him. I thought, I've got to, I've got to, this is a big thing I'm doing. And I should really pay attention to uh, what price was suffered by the German people. And I hope that comes through in the book. Yes, it does. And again, I can recommend uh, to read the book about Checkpoint Charlie and uh, everything that happened there. And uh, today, if you want to see the original Checkpoint Charlie Hut, the very latest version, and also the very first wooden front of the very first Checkpoint Charlie from 1961, 
that is here at the Allied Museum in Berlin. And you're welcome to visit the museum to look at those uh, remarkable and incredible artifacts. Ian, thanks a lot for telling us uh, about your book and about all the things you did uh, to investigate it. So enjoy the day and thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Goodbye.